Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. The Our Driving Concern Employer Traffic Safety Program is pleased to be able to offer the webinar, The Dangers of Drinking and Driving. I want to welcome our presenter this morning, Cindy Leonard, Program Manager with the National Safety Council. A few things to note before we get started. Everyone should be muted, but please press star six to be sure if you use the call-in method. This will minimize any background noise and ensure sound quality. The presentation was made available for download for note-taking. You do have the ability to type questions during the webinar using the chat function. Cindy may answer your questions during the presentation or choose to address questions at the end. If you should encounter any problems or issues, please type a message in the chat box or to let us know or email me at deanne.crane at nsc.org. Uh, excuse me, Cindy's contact information will be available on the last slide. There is a very brief post of survey as well at the conclusion of the webinar. This program is funded through grant dollars and provided at no cost to employers. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. And with that, I welcome Cindy and we'll turn it over to her to begin. Thank you so much, Deanne. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you could take this time to join us this morning to talk about a, what seems like an old and tired topic, right? I mean, we've all known that there are dangers of drinking and driving. We've all known that. But today, we're going to talk specifically about things that the employer can do in their arena to help their employees think a little bit differently when they're outside the workplace and possibly uh, drinking at an event or that kind of thing. We're also going to share some resources that are here and available in Texas. Um, and, and these resources can be used to, to share with your employees or to further promote the awareness within your uh, workplace regarding this type of impairment. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And what we see by and large, and I hope you're seeing this already if you're in Texas, you should be seeing some signs already out there addressing holiday impairment issues. Uh, one of the favorite ones that I, I've seen is focused here on the right. Only Rudolph should be should drive lit. Um, and that's just, you know, a little play on the idea of Rudolph's nose being lit and uh, the rest of us should not be behind the wheel while we're impaired. Another really important campaign that TxDOT has been funding this year is called SoberRides.org. And that's mentioned on the left here. And we will revisit that later on in another slide. So you'll have more information on that and how you can share that with your employees as well. You know, when we talk about impairment in general, we know that in the workplace, there are lots of ways that impairment impacts uh, work production and the bottom line, time missed from work, uh, and, and those kinds of things. And specifically with alcohol, uh, we know that employers sometimes have the tendency to think, well, we have a strong policy, no drinking allowed on, in the workplace, period. No drinking allowed in most workplaces, right, with, the, with a few exceptions. And so where employers may, um, may have a, a regrettable sense of this not being part of their issue is when they don't realize that the, the activities of the employees that happen beyond the workplace may actually impact some of the safety issues within the workplace. And specifically with alcohol, alcohol is legal, right? If you're over 21, it's legal. And so we know that if you're talking about a workforce, uh, you're talking about adults over 21 and you're talking about their being able to access alcohol uh, legally and very easily. So some of the ways that it can affect, impairment in general can affect the workplace are shown here. We know that impairment of any kind increases the risk of incidents and injuries, right? And that's across the board, any worker, any position that they have. Specific to those that are driving to and from work, we know in Texas we have a lot of commuters, a lot of commuters that are driving vehicles to and from work. We also have the person who's picking up donuts 
on the way to work or lunch for everybody for a lunch and learn. They're rushing in, they're rushing out. And so there's an increased risk of injury uh, and incidents for them as well if they are, are experiencing any type of impairment. Uh, we know that the people who are operating our machinery and our equipment are, are at a safety risk and, uh, and putting others at a safety risk as well. And for the person behind the desk, you know, who might be suffering through a, a regrettable hangover, even if they've got a desk job, their critical errors can cost the company money. Um, and, and we'll see a loss of productivity across all of these positions as well as somebody loses pace or focus or the ability to concentrate on their task due to alcohol specifically or impairment in general. So we see a lot of loss here. We see a lot of, of uh, loss of revenue, loss of time, loss of morale if somebody's impairment issues are impacting other employees. And we don't always tend to put a real dollar sign on what that loss of, of productivity and what those risks include. But it's good for you to keep these in mind as we go through the, uh, the webinar this morning as areas of risk for you. And one number that came, uh, came up while I was looking into this a little bit had to do with the drunk driving fatalities accounting for 34% of traffic fatalities during two seasons ago, two holiday seasons ago. Um, and we know that the higher the BAC, the more likely the drunk driving causes of fatality. And that's not a surprise, right? Now our 2018 data has just come in and we see a little bit of improvement in some of these areas. But taking the time to discuss alcohol impairment with your employees, to develop safeguards in place for social events, if you're sponsoring social events, those are the kinds of things that I want you to keep in mind today as we talk a little bit more about, um, about what's going on with alcohol impairment. So looking again at that data just a little bit more closely, in Texas, you can see that we have a pretty high percentage of fatalities in comparison to the nation overall. Um, you know, it, it looks as though from our data we are definitely uh, above the national average when it comes to alcohol impaired driving and the fatalities and injuries associated with that. Now again, I mentioned 2018 data is just now showing that we have seen a decrease nationally to about 29% of crashes. Um, and 33 states in DC have seen a decrease in alcohol impaired driving fatalities in the last year. So um, we're, we're glad to see that happening. In Texas, we see a decrease of over, overall fatal crashes at about 2.8%. So um, while the rest of the nation is decreasing in this area, Texas is decreasing as well, not quite the, to the national average. But it's important to keep in mind when we look at this overall uh, issue as it relates to Texans and as it relates to your workplace. So one tool, you know, we like to use tools to help us define what's going on. And one useful tool that I can really recommend is autoevolution.com. They have this blood alcohol calculator that requires very little information um, to be able to estimate how much alcohol concentration somebody has in their blood at any time, given the circumstances. So if we take this, uh, if we take this calculator and plug in some hypotheticals, we only need the person's weight, whether they're male or female, and how long ago they started drinking or what the duration of that drinking period was. And then we need a little bit of information on the types of alcohol and the quantities of alcohol, and that's it. That's all we need to calculate the blood alcohol concentration or, or an estimated concentration for any individual under these circumstances. Knowledge can be key, and starting this with your em, with employers, sharing with employees can be very beneficial. We know that a lot of employees may not grasp the real 
concerns and the real ramifications of their actions, getting behind the wheel when they know they're just a little bit buzzed, but they'll be all right because they're only driving a mile home and that kind of thing. If they have this knowledge in place ahead of time, if they have this awareness, then we know that they're going to make better decisions. And those better decisions are ultimately going to help the workplace and ultimately help all of us in general. So sharing this kind of calculator, I think, with your employees can be very beneficial for them to, to get grasp an understanding of what their, um, their behaviors may lead to. <clears throat> and so if we take a person who has a blood alcohol concentration of 0.117, we can watch the steady flow of that concentration diminish over time and see that they will be approximately alcohol-free by 11 a.m. the next morning. So I want you to think about that just for a minute. If this individual stops drinking at 2 a.m., they leave the bar because the bar closes around 2 a.m., and they decide to get home with whatever manner, let's assume that this individual is taking a ride share and she is not driving home and she's getting a couple hours of sleep and then her alarm is going off at 7 a.m. She's back in the car and she is out the door and ready to go uh, to work. Now, is she springy and spry? Probably not. She's probably feeling a little worse for the wear and that worse for the wear is the concern. It turns out a hangover is a sign of impairment. A hangover is a sign that somebody still has alcohol in their system if they've been drinking. So we see that she is going to be going to work through whatever means now while she's impaired. So whether or not she is a driver for you or she is a worker for you, when she shows up at 8 a.m., she is not completely free of the alcohol that she consumed late last night. So we know a lot of employers have seen this, right? You've seen this in your workplace. You've seen somebody come in a little worse for the wear on Monday morning, and maybe it's been the assumption that, oh, they'll just work through it. By noon, they're feeling much better, drink lots of coffee, drink lots of water, flush that system out. But really, this is somebody who is not fit to be in the workplace at this moment. This is somebody who should not be involved in any of the activities that we mentioned before, dealing with driving, dealing with heavy machinery, dealing with um, input data and computer and desk work. This is somebody who is, is still impaired. And any impairment, any sign of BAC in the bloodstream is a sign of impairment. And so <clears throat> this is, this is alarming for a lot of employers as we share it. Um, an, a hangover is an important symptom of impairment absolutely every single time. And alcohol is only directly expelled through breath and sweat. About 2 to 10% of that overall alcohol is only going to come out in those ways. It's going to take a long time for that alcohol to leave the system, and nothing adequately rushes it. So um, there are things to keep in mind next that would have to do with the individual being male or female. We can't talk about alcohol and metabolism without making this important distinction. When men and women consume the same amount, women will have higher blood alcohol concentrations due to a number of things. And a lot of, I think a lot of us are, are aware of this uh, at some level you know that it has to do with blood, uh, body composition, fat, water concentrations. But there's also something called alcohol dehydrogenous, and we abbreviate that as ADH. ADH is an enzyme that's responsible for metabolizing alcohol. Males naturally have a highly active ADH in their stomach and liver, and that can reduce the absorption of alcohol by as much as 30%. Women have very small amounts of ADH in contrast. Uh, women do not have as much as men. So if a woman is consuming beer for beer or spirit for spirit as much as, uh, as her male counterpart, she is going to have a higher BAC level. 
um, pretty at, across the board every single time. So it's important to understand a little bit about the body composition as we talk about alcohol and how it's concentrated. So looking at all of the impairment numbers associated with BAC, we've come up with a brief chart. This is from the NTSB, and they give us an idea here of what those BAC levels actually translate into when you're talking about driving or doing any other kind of important safety or life skill. So we see from this chart that impairment begins at 0.02 or two beers, but actually the National Safety Council and other organizations like to think that impairment begins with the very first drink. Impairment and loss of judgment begin immediately depending on what is in, in the stomach, depending on what the person has, is taking medication-wise. And so we don't see 0 0.02 as the beginning of impairment. We see it as much less than that. Now we know that reflectively, the public sees 0.08% as the be-all, end-all. And why do they do that? Well, that's the legal limit, right? In Texas, that's the limit. If you drink more and, and consume more and have a higher BAC than 0 0.08, you're going to, to face uh, prosecution. Actually, an important fact about that level is that the arresting officer can use their own judgment to determine if you are impaired at a lower level than 0 0.08. So in other words, if your BAC measures 0 0.06, 0 0.04, but the arresting officer sees impairment characteristics, some of them listed here in the chart, you can still be arrested for a DWI. So it's a misnomer, it's a misfact to think that BAC equals 0 0.08. It's really important to make that, that distinction with your employees so that they understand what, uh, what is impacting their driving and what is impacting, obviously, uh, you know, their ability to drive and, and potentially be arrested. Impairment begins with the first drink, period. And if that is our message, then what happens beyond this chart is going to be uh, possibly occurring to somebody who will not be behind the wheel. So let's take a look at some of these characteristics. We see here loss of judgment begins point, at point zero 0.02. I bring this out now because it's so important, it's very key to understand that we talk about having a plan before an event. If an event involves alcohol and there will be impairment, you want to have a plan of who's going to drive, how you're going to get home, how, you know, what transportation possibilities will be available, can you spend the night? If you wait until you've had those two beers to start scratching your head and thinking, well, I don't know, maybe I'll be all right to drive, <clears throat> you're already making your decision with a loss of judgment. So it's really a key factor to make that decision ahead of time. Make those decisions and those plans while there is no alcohol in the bloodstream and you will ensure that you're making the soundest decisions. Um, and, you know, beyond that point zero 0.02, we see all of these troubles and all of these um, impairment kind of compound as we go along. So all the way up to point 0.15 is where we stop, but we know that, that alcohol concentration can go much higher than that, unfortunately. And at 0.15, we're seeing serious difficulty controlling the car, focusing on driving, and that's not somebody that you want to be in a vehicle with, and it's certainly not, not the circumstance in which you want to be driving. So in this chart, we only looked at beer. Obviously, spirits and hard liquor has a higher concentration. Wine usually has a higher concentration. But just to keep things even, we, we just looked at beer and how much it would equate out to an impairment. You can kind of extrapolate from there um, what it would mean if this person was, in, was drinking um, hard liquor or something else. So moving on, with all those things in mind, these are some of the characteristics that overall we would see with somebody who was impaired in general. And this list is pretty it's pretty concise, it's not the be all end all, but it really helps us focus on some of the things that you may see in somebody 
and, you know, maybe you're not sure if they're impaired or not. Maybe you're not sure if they've been drinking or not. But if you have somebody in your workplace who's showing increased confusion and anxiety, that is not somebody who should be driving. And the, the cause of that increased confusion or that, the cause of the short-term memory loss, the cause of slower reflexes, that really is immaterial when it comes down to the safety. Yes, it's going to be important to maybe ascertain what's causing that, but it can be caused by a number of medical circumstances, a number of emotional circumstances in some cases. So alcohol or, um, or drugs may not be the cause of all of these signs and symptoms, but if these signs and symptoms are in play, then this is an individual who should not be involved in uh, operating heavy machinery or especially not somebody who should not be driving. So we know alcohol is going to impair that ability to drive because it's going to slow down coordination, judgment, and reaction times. And this list really helps us kind of narrow the field of what we might be looking at when we're seeing somebody who's, who has some alcohol impairment or other impairment. So talking a little bit about some of the resources that we have at TexasDrivingConcern.org, uh, we, have a, we have a whole page dedicated to impairment and impairment resources. The other thing that we have developed this year is a calendar page by the month, and this is an example of our December page. This is our poster, so to speak, that would go with the December calendar page, and then um, page two is, is a calendar grid. So you could use this as a send out to maybe include some events of your own or some safety talks of your own or some fact sheets that we have from Texas Driving Concern that deal specifically with impairment. You know, holidays bring out a lot of occasions, a lot of events that would involve somebody potentially drinking um, or drinking and driving. And this is a good time to bring that focus into your workplace and have some support and have some suggestions for your employees so that they're more aware. We always like to advocate planning ahead, and NHTSA has now developed a Safer Ride app that's available outside of Texas as well as inside of Texas. We know that it's available through, um, through Apple and through uh, iTunes. So this would be something that would be a great resource for any of your employees who are working or traveling beyond Texas, as well as sober rides. Um, and we want you to think a little bit about how you're going to plan social events for your employees in general around this time. Because if you are, you can be a really key part of making sure that they're arriving home safely. And one of the things that we advocate is to keep in mind what your safety leaders are going to need to have, what they're going to need to know ahead of time so that plans can be made that, uh, that are with safety in mind for everyone. You know, if you think about the fact that bars close somewhere between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., that's also the time frame that's associated with the greatest number of impaired, impaired drivers on the road. Well, doesn't that make sense, right? If the bars are closing, people are going home, therefore they're going to be potentially driving while they're intoxicated or impaired. So you want to plan events that would end before that time, right? Because if your employees are getting out around 2 a.m., then they have a higher likelihood of being involved with somebody who is impaired while driving and being involved in a crash. So why don't you think, think about keeping them off of the road during that time and getting them home earlier um, by ending your event earlier? We recommend you always plan events with a beginning and an end time and that, and that you have alcohol-free events considered or coupons in mind, uh, coupons, vouchers, that kind of thing that limit the number of alcohol drinks that somebody does consume at your at your event. And then another thing we recommend is thinking about um, providing some kind of voucher or share rides to employees for use. We've actually talked to some employers who do this um, outside of their own social uh, events that they have for, for the holidays. We know of employers who have, a, have two vouchers per year per employee that they, um, that they give them so that if, they, if the employee finds themselves in a difficult situation where they should not be on the road and they don't have another access 
um, to getting home that they can use these vouchers and the employee will pick up that tab. So that's a really generous idea, but it's also a really safe idea and it helps you consider um, consider their safety first preventatively before an incident occurs and ultimately the cost of that share ride that the employee is, the employer is picking up on on behalf is is much lower than the cost of that employee being in an incident having to um, take time off work to show up in court um, have an injury as a result of of a crash so Keep that in mind, and maybe that's something that your leadership could could in, involve um, as a part of their safety preventative measures for their employees. Another thing you should really think about is your employees who have a hard time during the holidays. Stress can come during the holidays in a ver in lots of different ways. We know there are people that might be employed for you or or um, in your workplace that don't have families that may be grieving, that may have experienced something throughout the year that is really driven home during the holiday season or um, some part of their, of their uh, struggle in life might really come into play during the holidays. And so you want to think about those people as well because they may be more likely to overconsume or not prepare um, ahead of time when they're going to an event. And so you want, you want to be thinking about them as you're making these plans and as you're helping your employees understand the dangers. The other thing that we have available through our website, um, are, a few of the, the tools that we have are listed here. We have a traffic safety huddle on impaired driving and we're also developing one right now on blood alcohol concentration specifically. And we expect that to be ready in the next couple of days and we expect to be able to forward that on to all of you through email. So um, that is a, that'll be a tool that you can use to talk specifically about alcohol and holidays and driving impairment free. So uh, keep that in mind as a possible safety talk or um, grabbing a minute with your employees to, to discuss. The video that we show here, we reference, it's about three and a half minutes long and we play it during our classes for drug impairment training and our driving concern training. So we opted not to play it for you today, but it's available through YouTube and I'll be sending you the link for that as well if you haven't seen it. Essentially, this video takes you through the experience that an individual has when they have their first DWI. Um, and beyond the $2,000 fine, how that impacts their life. And you see through the video, um, through these screenshots of, of these text messages that this individual suffers in multiple ways, including their personal life, including their job life, um, their family and friends get tired of, of giving them rides, and it's a multiple impact that that first DWI has on the individual. And it's very well illustrated in this video if you haven't seen it. So definitely uh, look at that as, as something that you could share with your employees, not necessarily through the holidays, but, but on other occasions or other safety events as well. And another great thing that we have through TechStot is a pass, a holiday pass is something that you can gift to your um, to your employees and there's a quick 15 second video here that um, we couldn't pull up because of the limitations of the demonstration today but it's very brief and it's almost like a little commercial that uh, shows you how easily having a holiday pass could ensure the safety of the people that you love or the people that work for you and maybe and sometimes that's both so your employer, as an employer, you can promote safe driving behaviors in a multiple ways for your employees. And these are great ideas to pass along, to share with them, to take the time to spend on this topic could be valuable for your workplace. And, you know, whenever you're talking about something that occurs beyond the workplace, um, and, and it has to do with safety, you're demonstrating to your employee base that you care about them. 
you're demonstrating that their safety and what they do matters to you and that they're important. They're an important part of your workplace and you are, are showing them by bringing awareness to them that you value what they do and you value having them in the workplace. And there's really no dollar amount that you can associate with that kind of, of, um, of caring and that kind of concern. We know that employees, when they feel valued, stay in a workplace longer. And having that employee retention rate increase or having that employer, employee retention rate be very high is ultimately good for your bottom line and it's ult ultimately good for your, for your business and the, the rest of the workers as well. So SoberRides.org, just to highlight one more time, share this resource with your employees and have them sign up for the app during a safety talk or have them sign up for the app when they come into the break room um, or, you know, offer a, a little piece of candy or a Hershey kiss or something for those who show that they have already signed up for the app. Just something really small really um, can be so impactful as having this app on their phone uh, and, and, and knowing that you've shared that with them can really mean a lot for them and mean a lot for you as well. So keep in mind also through January 2nd, this is a time period when we see more law enforcement available and uh, we see more law enforcement patrolling here in Texas. So this is obviously a time when employees um, can, you know, will see that concentration and hopefully they will, they will be flying under the radar, so to speak. They will be driving uh, with a plan and without impairment, and, and that can be the result of what you have brought them and shown them. So we appreciate you having that concern today and coming and sharing this time with us. Um, if you have any questions, now would be a great time to throw some in the chat box and I'll see if I can answer them. And beyond today, this will be recorded and shared on YouTube. We'll also be sharing some of these links and resources with you through an email, as well as a couple of other resources that we know might be valuable to you um, on this topic in particular. And if you have questions or if you have ways that we can support you in your transportation safety initiatives, my contact information is here. Lisa's contact information is here you know that you can reach out and, and uh, we'll be glad to help you in any way that we can. So Deanne, do you thank you. do, oh, go ahead, honey. Yeah, thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, as I'm closing, if anyone has any questions or uh, please type them in the chat box as, as we're, we're closing out the session and, and Cindy will be happy to answer those for you. I want to thank Cindy for such an, an impactful and educating uh, webinar. And I want to thank everyone else who attended today. We know your time is valuable, and we hope you gain some useful information and resources that will assist you going forward. I do want to remind everyone to please do the post-event survey. That helps us going forward with future webinars. And also, please make sure you check out our upcoming webinars after the new year. They will be listed on our website. And I don't see any questions coming in. I'll give you just a couple of, of more seconds to type anything in. And with that, um, I don't see any, any, any questions, so with that, um, we will end the webinar. We want to thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be turned.